Hi, this is Miranda from Speaking Through the Fog. Um, as promised, this is chronic fatigue syndrome's history. Um, it's part two of my uh, chronic fatigue um, series. I'm going to jump right into it because I've got a lot of history that I have to go over and not that much time. So chronic fatigue syndrome started um it's kind of debated. Um, the first mention I could find and the one that they think is Sir Richard Manningham in the 1750-ish era, he describes something he called fabricula, which is really cool, I think. It means little fever. His description, and I quote, is little low continued fever, little transient chilliness, listlessness with great lassitude all over the body, little flying pains. Sometimes the patient is a little delirious and forgetful. Little, little, little. <laughs> he then goes on to explain that it seems to mainly affect women of the upper class that have reason to be sedentary. He also mentions that the illness is usually exhibited after an event that causes grief, intense thoughts, um, and uh, after a cold or a flu. And all of these sound really, really um, familiar to chronic fatigue syndrome. Um, but some people debate whether that's true or not. The 1860s, however, Dr. George Beard, and this is where most people um, confirm that it started. Uh, he um, recorded something called neurothensia, and he was one of the first neurologists. And he, um, at the time, they were calling it nervous exhaustion. It was kind of like a hysteria kind of thing. But um, he said a lot of the same things that um, Doctor or Sir Richard Manningham had described. Um, he also said, though, that uh, neurothensias uh, must involve both inclusion and exclusion to form a diagnosis, and that um, he'd also seen acute cases that were only short-term and then some really serious cases that seem long-term, which sounds very familiar to what the chronic fatigue is today. Um, there's also been some articles and prominent health journals that suggest that um, some really famous people, Charles Darwin and Florence Nightingale, famous scientists, um, super driven, super active, very um, smart, got stricken down by sickness um, after getting a flu. And it, that just sounds like a story of chronic fatigue. A lot of people think that that's what happens. Um, and then there's some early uh, medical papers that mention that Hippocrates, uh, Hippocrates, I'm sorry, um, described cases of chronic uh, fatigue syndrome um, it, like illness in his um, texts as well, which means it would have went back further, way further than we thought. In the early 20th century, there was a series of outbreaks. Um, there was outbreaks in um, Iceland and Los Angeles County Hospital. There was an outbreak in New York, and they all thought it was maybe a polio or a form of polio. And then they were surprised to find no polio virus at all. So they were calling it atypical poliomyelitis, and we're thinking it might be like another form, like something completely different. But it resembled so much like polio they were um not completely uh um convinced that it wasn't um so it kept you know popping up in medical history all these little pockets of outbreaks um there was a one even in 1956 in a britain's royal free hospital and at this time um they were just naming it by the outbreak um uh, where it happened. So this, they started calling it royal free, um, disease, but, um, an article wanted something that like kind of combined them all together. So, um, someone suggested myalgic encephalitis or encephalitis <laughs> and uh, that name meant swollen, uh, brain. And it, it, that was at the time and still by some people now the cause of the disease. And um, in 1969, benign myalgic encephalitis was <laughs> encephalitis was added to the international classification of diseases, and um, it's it's still in there today. Um, a lot of doctors like to ignore this, um, 
uh, over the fifth edition of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, but yes, it is still listed there. So um, an outbreak that was really serious for the um, chronic fatigue uh, community was one in the 1980s, and there was a lot of outbreaks in the 1980s, but the biggest one was in Incline Village, and it was actually a, a doctor started to realize and was not um, attributing the symptoms to something he'd ever known before. So he called in the CDC for a possible um, oh, outbreak. What is that called? Um, oh, I'm sorry. Part of my um, illness. Uh, not an outbreak. Epidemic. An epidemic. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, they, he was saying, you know, he thought it was an epidemic and it hit the upper class really hard. Um, and so any the government took notice and sent some CDC um, scientists out. But the doctor um, in an interview actually said that he felt like they didn't really do anything. They went there, they skied, they took a few blood tests, they um, did a few interviews, but really all in all they didn't do anything and when they flew out they did a report saying it was a mass hysteria and um, the whole chronic fatigue community just, you know, sighed in sadness because they thought that this might be the thing that, you know, really got the wheels going and brought it to the public eye, but it turned out to be um, almost detrimental. There is something good that came out of it. A lot of the scientists who have done um, the work and the, have made the breakthroughs had actually flown out separate of the CDC um, to do um, research on the people in uh, Incline Village, and it really affected them, and they that's what really told a lot of them, this is a virus, we need to start um, looking into it. So... In uh, 1986 and 1987, um, that's when chronic fatigue syndrome, the name, really came about. And it was because a panel of like scientists and government agencies and um, held a meeting basically saying <laughs> myalgic encephalomitis is, um, I see I'm having, is a hard word um is a mouthful and people aren't really going to remember it. So we've got to think of something better. And somebody suggested chronic fatigue syndrome. They wound up picking it, not knowing that um, it was going to devastate so many people. The CDC um, took it and ran with it and made all of the um, diagnostic criteria. And um, that's where chronic fatigue syndrome came from. Um, and it basically stopped any progress, dried up research or dried up research funds, and um, really turned the public eye against chronic fatigue sufferers because uh, chronic fatigue syndrome sufferers because it just so belittles the um, sufferer. It doesn't sound like anything that serious. Um, I heard in one documentary somebody say that would be like saying somebody with emphysema has chronic cough syndrome. It just doesn't sound that bad. Anyways, in 1990 Newsweek, and everybody was excited about this, um, a major publication um, talked about chronic fatigue syndrome, and it was an when you actually read it, uh, the chronic fatigue sufferers were very, very upset because they nicknamed it the yuppie flu and because it only hit um, women in the middle class, middle upper class um, and hardworking people. They thought it was some type of burnout, um, a psychologically just too tired. And um, so this Base and all of the history between this and 2006 was people, the advocacy groups and the government agencies fighting over changing the name chronic fatigue syndrome. Um, I'm sure there was advancements, just very little and not very much to report. Um, in 2006, I would love to say something good happened, but something really bad happened, which is the PACE trial, or the PACE, I'm sorry, I want to say trial, but the PACE uh, test, and um, I could go into it. I'm going to make a um, 
I'm going to make a video about it. it. It angers me. I'll just say it was bad science, poor parameters. Um, the ethics board should have gotten involved. Um, and it basically said that people who had chronic fatigue could get better with graded exercise and cognitive therapy. And cognitive therapy is just basically your thoughts are bad, your thoughts are negative, let's change them to positive and you'll get better. Well, the chronic fatigue community knew immediately that this was wrong, but the rest of the uh, community or public, public loved this. Um, newspapers were printing things like, you know, good thoughts and exercise cures chronic fatigue sufferers, which implies that chronic fatigue suffers are lazy and uh, good thoughts would mean you know their thoughts are bad and it's, so it's all in their heads so this thought this in 2006 really solidified what doctors were wanting to say already that it was a psychiatric issue and um, to this day a lot of um, prominent uh, health institutions such as the Mayo Clinic, a lot of the science are uh, the science research medical hospitals are still holding on to this belief that graded exercise and um, cognitive therapy is the way to go. Um, but the good news I have to say, and I'm sorry it's so recent, but in 2015 the government agencies um, got enough evidence basically they finally had a biological mar marker, which is that um, CPET test, which I talked to you about in one of my videos, and um, other, um, the Stanford brain scans, and just, you know, patient um, uh, studies. And they finally um, said, you know, we got to change the name. People aren't taking it seriously enough. We got to change the definition of the um, diagnosis. We got to change how we treat people in medicine, how we would treat it. Let's write a new report. And they put this new report out and um, their recommendation is systemic exertion and tolerance disease. I think that's not that good of a name. I'll discuss that next time. Um, but uh, what's really exciting is that they classified it as a disease and um, some of the people who were kind of not focusing on uh, chronic fatigue syndrome was now saying they're going to dedicate money and time towards research. And it sounds like the ball's starting to get rolling again after 20 years, 20, 30 years of it being at standstill because of um, the name chronic fatigue. So, um, yeah, uh, at least I can end on a good note. And uh, that's the history. Sorry I went 